So this will be a good chance to do everything, everything we've done so far this semester uh, for, uh, for um, a review and then branch off into some additional things. So <clears throat> we, did, we did a web page about winter. Let's look ahead towards spring. I know I'm picking these really controversial topics. All right. uh, so let's go in and let's create a web page. Yes? Um, regarding the homework, yeah, I know you said we could have it a little late. Is there a certain amount of days you're giving us before it is considered late? Days? I was thinking like like a few minutes. Okay. Like if it was turned in like at 12, 15. Uh, to yeah, at least you're giving us something. I'll take that. No, uh, no there, I don't have any particular number of days in mind. Okay. I mean, you know, try to get it in as quick as possible, okay. you know. Okay. Um, so, I'm going to build my page. I'm going to start with the doc type, which tells the browser what version of HTML we are using. I have my HTML tag, which goes around everything. I'm then going to have a head and body section. <clears throat> the head section is only going to contain the title, and it's going to contain the link to my CSS. Anything that's going to appear on the page proper is going to be in the body section. You could consider the stuff in the head section to be stuff about the page. But none of the stuff in that, that, that is to appear in the actual screen itself is, is in the body. Or is in the head. It, it would appear in the body. So let's make our style sheet. Um, and I'm going to create a new document. And... I'm just going to start out just by putting the body, background, green, color, white. What does that mean? <clears throat> that means that anything in the body section of the page. That is the whole page, right? It's going to have a background of green and a color of white. Again, I'm just taking the, the easiest, uh, maybe later on we'll refine the colors to maybe be a little more subtle, but I'm just going for something quick that we can see. And green seems like an appropriate spring color, so we'll do that. So I'll save this as, I'll put it on the desktop, hopefully we'll remember it. I'll save this as a cascading style sheet file, and I'll call it main.css. Link type equals text slash CSS, rel equals style sheet. We are again assuming that everything's in the same folder. So I can say href equals and simply do main.css. I'm going to do a tiny piece of this at a time simply because uh, that's sort of a better way to do it rather than do everything all at once and test it and find that it doesn't work. Do a tiny bit at a time and test it. Yes. And your link to the style sheet, do you have to have the type? I, I think you can omit the type. Okay. Yeah, that's just force of habit. You used to have to put that in there. I think you can get by with just the rel equal style sheet and all that. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to put the main sections of my page. I might refine them further, but to start out, we'll put them in. We're 
we're going to do the internal links, which we talked about towards the end of class last time. We're going to link to different areas on our page. some things we like about spring it's warm. Warmer. okay so I'm going to put these in a unordered list because again navigation essentially is an unordered list of links so my first list item will be a link it's not a link to a separate page it's going to be a link to um, a spot inside of this page so I'm going to do length pound sign weather. Notice again, I talked about this before, I can arrange the tags whatever way I think makes it look readable. So in this case, I put the LI, the A, the end A, all on one line. If you don't like that, if you think it's more readable to separate it out between several lines, you're welcome to do that as well. So, this is okay too. Because remember, the browser takes all the white space it gets, all the white spaces, and extra spaces, extra tabs, extra carriage returns, and converts it into a single space. So it doesn't really matter if you had it like I had it before or you had it like this. The HTML is going to display the same. Now that should go to Section ID of weather. Um, that's a good point. Section and article. Um, there really isn't a huge difference between them. This, you, you know, you can make things sections or you can make them articles depending on just your viewpoint. Uh, this might be better as an article if there's going to be a lot of words. If it was a combination of words and pictures, maybe you could call it a section, you know. Um, so I, I guess don't worry. Whichever you decide is fine. Just be consistent. So I'm going to, uh, since I did articles in the last example, I might as well do sections here. Uh, the one thing I talked about last time is something called Greek text. Greek text keeps me from having to type a long thing and, and make it up. Uh, graphic designers have used it for years, like when they're doing sample layouts for things. So I'm going to do that. And again, I'm doing that just for demonstration purposes. If you're building a prototype, and later on we'll, we'll talk about prototypes, like prototypes like a model, then sometimes it's okay to use Greek text just to say, well, I know these aren't the real words, but this is what your page is going to look like. All right? So if we Google Greek text, we can ask for two paragraphs of Greek text, and it will give me two paragraphs of Greek text. So I'm just going to cut that out and paste it on the page. And again, because it's not real text, I'm not too concerned about putting in the carriage returns to make it look like a paragraph. And again, the nice thing is, is the browser doesn't care about that. All right, so let's look at, uh, at this now. I'll save it on my desktop because that's where I saved the CSS file. I'll save it as an HTML file. And I'll call it Spring. So 
here we have our two files. If I open this up, there we have it. All right. That should say weather. It doesn't scroll to it because it's already displaying on the screen. So like if I go like this and click the weather, then it will scroll to it. Now, the one thing I notice a lot of students do when they first start getting color is they'll pick colors that look good, but they don't do anything with the links. And that sometimes can leave the links very difficult to read. Like this link, it, either the blue or the magenta was difficult to read uh, on this background. So remember, if you set the color of a page, the links have their own defaults. So if I say everything in the body, it's literally not everything in the body. It doesn't cover links. So if I want links to have a different color, I can go in and I can give the, the, the color, uh, you know, I have to give the color. How would I give a color for a link? Do it in CSS. Do it in CSS. That's a good observation, first of all. I would say A, so every A tag. I would, uh, whoops. I hate when things do that for me. A, I can give a color of, let's try yellow. All right. Does that mean someone likes yellow? <laughs> I got the right answer. So I could do that. And now, the link is yellow. Yeah, that doesn't look too bad. We'll stick with that. Uh, now, the only problem with that is if I just say a yellow, it doesn't change when I visited that link. So I can actually say a colon visited and maybe make the color something else. Um, Let's try orange. Let's see if that works. All right, there it's yellow if I haven't visited and orange if I do visit it. Now I could do some cool things if I put the mouse over it. So I can do a hover. And I could make the color of this white. put the mouse over it then it changes to white. That gives the user uh, an extra visual clue that it is a link. So normally links, you know, this is pretty clear there's a link because it's underlined uh, and if you give the hover property um, that that allows uh, the user to know for sure that's it. Yes? So if we do the hover property can we get rid of the underline? Yes. Yes, you can, you can get rid of the underline if you do the hover property. All right. There's a lot of ways to represent things as links. All right. Um, and so uh, as long as it's clear to people, then, you know, it's okay. Usually people can tell the links, uh, the main navigation links, just based on their position on the page. You know, uh, usually they run a banner around the top. So let's go and let's, let's add a second article here. What's something else we like about Spring. Flowers. Flowers. Okay. So let's go in and I'll just copy this menu selection. And we'll do flowers.
and I do that and there I have my two links and I can scroll to it to see it scroll to it to see it now getting rid of the underline yes Yes. Um, if you if if you made this an ordered list and not an unordered list, it will show up in numbers. All right. Usually, you use an ordered list if the numbering is something that is you know hard and fast. Like if you took a survey and this is what the number one answer. Like if this is Family Feud. The number one answer of what people like about spring, if they said weather, then I would use an ordered list because the order matters. Here, I'm just literally thinking things off the top of my head. The order doesn't really matter. It's arbitrary, in which case I'd use an unordered list. Now, you could put other things on the list besides the bullet point. If we look for list style type, We can see some of the list style types we can have. We can have a circle, a square, a disk, traditional Armenian numbering, which I'm not really sure what that is, decimal, decimal leading zeros, Georgian, Hebrew numbering, and all that. You have a lot of choices. You also have the ability to put none. So if you want to get rid of those bullet points to the point of the student before, it's kind of obvious that those, uh, those are the navigation links, right? So I could say If you look at what I've done here, notice my selector is a little bit different. All these other selectors, I have one tag listed, body, A. In the case of A, I have these what are called pseudo, um, pseudo classes, A hover, A visit. <coughs> In this case, I have two tags, nav and UL. What this means is any UL within the navigation section will get this rule. No other UL. So if I have a list in the middle of my page, so if I have another list in my page that, you know, put that in the flower section. Maybe it shows a list of flowers that typically bloom in the spring. If I do that, notice that the style rule applies to the navigation, but not this. All right? So, a selector is a thing before the set of curly braces. A selector determines what on the page gets that style rule. And we only scratch the surface on the different kinds of selectors that you've had. The most basic kind of selector is where you just have a single HTML tag, body, A, whatever. More involved selectors, we can combine HTML tags. And what this one says is only ULs within the nav section get this rule. All right? Only ULs within the nav section get this rule. Any other ULs on the page don't get that rule. Now, if we want to get rid of the underline, 
let's say we want to get rid of the underline, but only for things in navigation. We might want to keep the underline if there is a link in the middle of a paragraph. So we could do this. Let's put in a link to Google. And again, that's a link to someone else's web page. So it starts with http slash slash google.com. All right, there we have the link for that. If I want to get rid of these, I can say in my style rule, what do you think I would say in my style rule? Pardon me? Um, nav, a. nav A, exactly. So I could say Nav A, and I'll say Text Decoration. None. So those are not underlined. But this one that's not in the navigation section is underlined. Now notice, this is the whole cascading part of cascading style sheets, right? I have a rule defined for A's, and I have a rule defined for nav A's. Which rule does a link in the navigation get? It gets both of them. All right. It gets the, the color from this one. It gets the text decoration from this one. Now, if I happen to put a color in here, then that color would overrule the cover on just the link. Again, the whole idea of this is the more specific the rule is, it takes precedence. So if I were to make the color... black on this, then nav A's would be black. Um, I'd have to do, I'd have to, it was visited, so the visited overruled, yeah. Uh, but if I did a nav A visited color black, then it would get the color black. So an element on the page can get its style from several different things. If we look at, let's change it back to the way it was before. Why does this link look this way? Well, it gets the background of green from the body style rule. It gets the color of orange from the A visited style rule. And it gets the fact that it's not underlined from the nav A style rule. Those cascade on down. And that's, again, cascading style sheets. So a little bit of care is good when you take these to write and keep it simple, and you can then more easily and more effectively style the page. I might even want to make those a little bigger. All right? So I might say nav A, uh, maybe font size, 1.2M. I always make those links a little bit bigger. I could even put a border around them if I wanted to. To help distinguish that those are links if I wanted to. Now, I'm just sort of <coughs> arbitrarily, 
arbitrarily just picking things. We'll go over them more systematically, but just know that if there's anything you want to do in CSS, anything that seems reasonable that you want to do the appearance, chances are there's a way to make that style rule do it. So borders, colors, font sizes. It's just a matter of Googling it if there's something that we, we want to do that we haven't covered in class. Um, all right, what else did we cover? Um, we covered external links. We covered a link to another one of my pages. I won't do that right at this moment. Um, one thing that we did not talk about is link to an email address. I could make a link so that when you clicked my name, it opened up the person's email client and started an email to my email address. And the way you do that is with a link, a href equals and then instead of the other stuff, you type in mail to and the email address. Now, I don't know if email, if Outlook is installed on this machine or not, so we'll, we'll test it out, but it might not work. No, any email client. So if you had some other email client uh, set up, it would work for that as well. So if I go click on that, yeah, it doesn't know, so it's, it, it's asking me how I want to open up the mail to. That's because the email hasn't been set up correctly on this machine. I clicked OK, and yeah, it's, gonna, it's going through the setup procedure. The other thing you could do on a mobile device is you can use a phone number. So you could say a href equals tel, I believe, 4400366 and make sure I just have the syntax right Which again won't work. All right. Because it isn't set up, but if I had Skype, for example, installed, I could select Skype. Or if this is a, uh, a mobile device, I could, uh, it would, you know, if it was my phone and I was accessing this, I could uh, go and, and view that. All right. Um, special characters. Uh, some people asked, for example, on their first uh, a less than sign because if I, because a, uh, a less than is a tag automatically. All right. There's a set of special characters that you can put in, and if you Google HTML special characters, you'll see those. And one of them is there's a whole bunch more. Uh, I want to do the copyright symbol, which is ampersand copy semicolon. They all start with the ampersand and end with the semicolon. So at copy semicolon does the copyright symbol. So if you want to do that instead of writing out the word copyright, that's something cool that you can do. All right, let's get into images. I think it's a good time to start that. There's something else I was thinking of, but I don't remember what it is. Oh, I know, we can do this real quick first. Uh,
This is a little bit ahead, but one thing you can do in your head section is put this in. This is something that helps the way it displays on a mobile device. How can you view it on a mobile device? Well, if you're running, and notice that makes no difference if I'm viewing it in a desktop browser, but if you go to Developers Tools, More Tools, Developers Tools, and you click this little thing here, I'm sorry, this thing here, you can pick to emulate a Galaxy 5, and that's how this page would look like on that kind of device. That's kind of a neat thing that you can do. Uh, with this. Because obviously uh, having web pages work in a mobile mode is you know more critical than it was maybe even five years ago. Uh, definitely ten years ago. Um, so we're going to pay close attention to that. And the viewport is just something that you can put in. I just thought I'd mention that now. It's a good habit to go into when you're doing a page to look how it's going to look like on a mobile device and look how it's going to look like on different browsers. All right, we went over, uh, we've tested so far in Google Chrome. We could test how this would work in Internet Explorer by right mousing and saying open with Internet Explorer. All right, it looks about the same. We could test it on other browsers as well. We could open it in Microsoft Edge. We could open it in Firefox. I wouldn't anticipate any web page this simple to have problems, but it's still a good habit to get into, just to make sure that uh, you don't run into any problems. When we start doing more involved things, you're gonna, you know, you run the risk of it working in one browser but not the other. All right, images. What I'm going to do is I'm going to Google uh, images of flowers, spring flowers. And we're going to find something we like. Now, can I just take a, an image I get off the internet and use it? No. Um, it really depends on a number of different things. <coughs> uh, there are rules, for example, in a classroom situation, and I've posted those uh, for fair use. And you're absolutely right. I could take an image provided I gave credit for it. I could take a copyrighted image. It would just be like, like quoting someone in a term paper. You know, you can quote someone in a term paper provided you cite the source. Or you could take an image from another website provided you cite the source. However, there are, uh, that is just normal photos that are copyrighted. What does a, a photographer have to do to copyright an image? It's a little bit of a trick question. You're absolutely right. You don't have to do anything. If you've taken a pic, yeah. If you've taken the photo, you own the copyright to it. Now, there are things called Creative Commons licensing. All right. Whereas the photographer will say, "Hey, look, you're free to use this picture. You're free to use it for non-commercial reasons. So if you just have a personal web page that you made, sure." Or if you're a nonprofit organization, sure. You can also license it to say, hey, you're free to use it even for commercial reasons. You could say you can use it and as long as you don't alter it, or that you can use it and alter it. There's all kinds of different licensing for it. But we can search in Google Images to say, give me. Anything that is labeled for reuse. So I can use any of these. These are licensed under a 
uh, Creative Commons license. So I'm going to pick this image. I'm going to right mouse and save it. And I'm going to save it on the desktop. All right, because again, just like with the CSS files, uh, I'm going to put everything in one folder. So I'm going to put everything in the desktop. Now, I'm going to visit that page so I can take the link to credit it to. All right. Now, let's go in and put this on our page. I'm going to rename it to just crocus.jpg. One thing I think I mentioned before is that it's important to be able to see the file extension because when you put an image on the page, you need to get the file name and file extension exactly correct. Some JPEGs and .jpg, some and .jpeg, and some I think even and .jpe. So you have to have the exact extension name for the image to work. So. Depending on your operating system, there's different ways to make sure that that extension shows. Sometimes people have it so that the extension is hidden because they don't want to bother seeing it. But as web developers, we want to see it. So you should configure your operating system to show that. So I'm going to go in here and I'm going to say in my flower section, Put in a paragraph the image. So the image is a IMG tag. There's two properties that the image tag has. Obviously, we have to say which image we want. All right. You do that with the SRC property. If it's in the same folder as your HTML and your CSS, then you just put the name of it there, crocus.jpg. All right. It's best not to use a complete URL. That's known as hot linking the image. Uh, that's, that's dangerous because a person who has that image could actually change the image to something else, and you might get an uninvited image on your page. The next required um, attribute is an alt attribute. And this is where you put a short text description saying what the image is. Now that short text description will show up under certain circumstances. One circumstance is if that, the, the, that link to that image got broken somehow. If that file accidentally got de uh, deleted. At least the person knows what's supposed to be there. All right, small consolation, right? But it does show that. Secondly, if someone is visually impaired and is accessing the uh, web page through a screen reader, it will at least read the text in the alt attribute to the person to give them some sense of what, what was there. All right? Again, uh, nothing you can do to help someone that can't see see an image, but at least you can explain what that image was. All right? Now, the image tag is a little bit weird compared to other tags in that it doesn't really need an ending tag. All right? Now, if that bothers you, you can put an ending tag right after it. All right? That way every tag has an ending tag. The other thing you can do is you can put the slash here. And that is known as an empty tag, and that tells you that this is a start and end tag rolled into one. So you have choices there. I don't really care which one you do. You can either omit the ending tag, you can put the ending tag right after it, or you can use the slash uh, greater than sign. So now when we view this, go ahead. Pardon me? Image size. Okay. Well, right now, I didn't say anything about the image size. All right, so it's going to be however big the image is. 
all right, which I think in this case is pretty big. All right, so we'll view it this way, then we'll talk about what you can do via regarding the images. All right, so let's go and view this. And sure enough, it's a, it's a gigantic picture. I don't know, I kind of like it like that, though. All right, but let's say that's too big. All right, we can talk about what you want to do to make it, make it smaller. Okay, the other thing I would want to do is I would want to put a link to the credit for that image. Because again, even though this is licensed with the Creative Commons license, we still should be giving whoever took the photo credit. So now if we want to make it smaller, all right, <coughs> there's a couple ways we can make it smaller. And there's, there's an occasion to do all of these. One thing that you can do is you can, through the CSS, you can say how big you want to make it. The other thing you can do is through the HTML element that you could, you could make it smaller. You could give a, a width to it. But if you do that, the person is still downloading the full size image. So normally what you want to do is you want to edit the image. Okay? You want to edit the image because then you can resize it so that the person only downloads however size of the image it is. All right? Because right now, I mean this is not a gigantic image and people have fast internet connections now, but this image is 104 KB. If you had enough of these images on a page, that could add up and could, on a slow internet connection, make it a slow download. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a smaller copy of this. <clears throat> now, before you go resizing an image, you should make a copy of it first. Because if you make an image smaller, you can never make it be bigger again without losing quality. All right? You've gotten rid of some information when you shrink an image. You've gotten rid of some of the pixels. All right? And if you make it bigger, the photo editor will take a shot at making it bigger, but it's not going to do a good job. I'll probably demonstrate that next time to make the point clear. But just as a caution, I'm going to make a copy of this and keep it, and I'm going to rename it to original. All right, now I'm going to go in and make it smaller. Now, there's all different kinds of things that you can use to edit images. Um, you should be familiar with, at the very least, how to resize it. If you use Windows, there's Paint. That will get the job done for just resizing. Uh, there are a lot of other uh, applications available. Photoshop is, is a famous one. The GIMP is another one, which is open source, which means that it's free, which is cool. I'm going to go here into paint with this image, and I'm going to try to remember how to resize it. said, I'm going to try to remember how to resize in paint. Let's try that. Yeah. I do this every semester. It's like not where I would expect it. It's in crop. Okay. I'm going to want to lock the aspect ratio. The aspect
the aspect ratio is a ratio of the height to the width. If I don't lock that, I have the possibility of stretching out the photo one way or another, either making it too long and not tall enough or too tall and not wide enough. So I'm going to lock aspect ratio, and I can go in and say, well, let's make this 300 pixels wide. Oh, that's still going to crop it. Canvas options? Resize canvas. Okay, there we go. Lock aspect ratio. We can make this 400. And there is a smaller version of it. And then I can... Pardon me? It's cropped as well. It's not resized. It did. It did. Resize image with canvas. There you go. I hope. This isn't it. I'm just going to quit. There you go. There you go. You have to click that on. Thank you. Thanks for noticing that. I didn't, I did not notice that. You can go here and save it. Rate it, no thanks, because it's horrible. And now if we do that, then the image is smaller. But again, I can't make it bigger again, so it's good to have the original. If I decided that I made it too small, I could not go and take this and make it bigger again. I'd have to go with the original and resize it again. All right, we'll continue on with images on Tuesday of next week. I will remember, I will go on like the lab, I will come back here and I will remember to take a copy of the example so I can post it along with the video. And uh, then we'll see you in lab.